Arnie, when I first wanted to go into brain science and came here to Brain Research Institute at UCLA more than 40 years ago, I was only interested in, in function. How can the brain do all the things that we know it does? I really had no interest in structure and anatomy. And quickly I found out, especially in the course I took from you, that structure is extremely important to understand function. Let's review that. All right. Well, structure and function are the two sides of the coin, aren't they, Robert? Yeah. Uh, I think the first thing to realize is that brain tissue has evolved in order to produce behavior. There's a famous uh, example of a, uh, a form that is mobile in its early years and then attaches itself to a rock and becomes, as we say, sessile and moves no more. It has a nervous system during its mobile years and as soon as it attaches to the rock and becomes just a fixture, the nervous system deteriorates. Uh -huh. So if we think of the nervous system then as a system to generate behavior, then the next question is, how do we make that behavior relevant to the situation in which the organism finds itself, which means we have to have sensory input. So I think we can think initially of brain behavior as a symphony made up of input and output. And then what joins the two of them together is the modulation and integration of this information so that in truth, the behavior of the organism is appropriate to the circumstance at hand. I have a brain here, actually it's half a brain, and it illustrates some very basic but interesting things this about it. This is a human brain? This is the human brain. We're looking here at the inner or medial surface. This is one half of a hemisphere, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what we also see is the brain stem that's coming up. It's a continuation the of the spinal cord. cord, right? The brain stem enters at the base here continues and then, in a sense, becomes lost at this point as it becomes overwhelmed by surrounding cerebral cortex. In general, information, Robert, comes in from the spinal cord through the brain stem and also through a number of nerves that are surrounded, involved in the face and head. The optic nerve. The, exactly. They the come auditory. in at a brain stem level. So between the input coming from spinal cord, from the whole rest of the body, and the brain stem itself, we have here the complete panoply of input. The brain stem itself, uh, made up of medulla, pons, midbrain, and the most uppermost, we say the most rostral or head end part of the brain stem, thalamus and hypothalamus. These represent areas where information can be processed at increasingly more sophisticated levels. But for the final integration and the evolution of the appropriate behavior, the cortex has to be relied on. Obviously, if you have an accident, a thrombosis, a clot, or a hemorrhage at any point along the line, the input or the output may be circumscribed or destroyed, and then we have pathology, we have disease, we have a stroke, for instance. So all of these are possibilities. And that's one of the ways that we historically have learned how specific areas of the brain have functioned. When there's a problem, the stroke, a, a wound, a gunshot, different, different problems that happen, and we can isolate that, and we'd see the loss of function, we know what it it does normally when, they're, when everything is whole. Absolutely. These are what we used to call nature's experiments. <laughs> Today, of course, we can do experimental procedures in animals and recreate them and then study the consequences. Uh, so if we look here, we, we see the, the, the coming up from the spinal cord, the pons, the midbrain, thalamus. This is the cerebellum. And then the cerebrum. Can you just describe very briefly what each one of these does? And certainly. Point out. Certainly. In the brain stem, basic functions are subserved. For instance, control of respiration, heart rate, basic gastrointestinal function, 
in the medulla and the pons. As a matter of fact, this area of the brain stem is the one part of the entire nervous system that you cannot live without. Mm. When John Kennedy was shot, when Bobby Kennedy was shot, they both lost their lives because this area was sacrificed. And it can be very small. It can be quite small. You can it's lose remarkable. a huge amount of the hemisphere and still be relatively uh, normal uh, and live, but uh, a tiny uh, 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 trauma here and you die. So it is, it is that critical. Then as we move up, we come to this area that we call the midbrain, that's above the medulla and pons, and here we begin to get more holistic functions. As a matter of fact, there are a number of nuclei, that is, conglomerates of cells in these areas, each with a specific chemical signature, mm. and a group of them producing, some of you perhaps have heard the terms uh, noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, the chief sources of these basic neurotransmitters, the technical name for them, is found here. Mm -hmm. And these areas in turn are controlled by feedback fibers from large parts of the cortex mm -hmm. so that the way we think can really affect the way we feel because these neurotransmitters mm -hmm. are basic to our feeling tone, and even to our personality. Robert is Robert, Arnie yeah. is Arnie, yeah. in part because of our specific combination of chemicals from this midbrain area. That are, are modulated by the thoughts Absolutely. and memories and associations that we have that feed back. And it's a two-way street, two street, because these in turn play back on these. It's an old paradigm and an old uh, model in the uh, uh, central nervous system. If A projects to B, usually B projects <laughs> right, back to right. A. Now, many of the activities in this whole area are subconscious. There are things that occur that are not volitional on well, our part. I'm very glad you brought that up because it is said that up to the junction between midbrain and thalamus, mm. up to that junction, everything that goes on is outside our area of consciousness, it is automatic, non-conscious. The dawn of consciousness appears, for most, most people feel this way now, the dawn of consciousness seems to develop when you get to this thalamic level. Mm. But this is a very stark, black-white yeah, type yeah, of conscious yeah. experience. It takes the cerebral hemispheres to fill this out, load it with images, with the nuances of feeling. Mm -hmm. And so, they are, as I say, they're working together every moment.